You will hear a conversation between a woman making inquiries and a school receptionist. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion, only the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good afternoon, Estelle speaking. What can I do for you? I was told that the school holds um, adult education classes. Yes, it does. We run seven a week, three on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and one on Wednesdays. The receptionist Estelle says the school holds seven classes a week, so seven has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully. And answer questions one to six. Good afternoon, Estelle speaking. What can I do for you? I was told that the school holds um, adult education classes. Yes, it does. We run seven a week, three on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and one on Wednesdays. Are they all evening classes? No. Because of the number of people who work shifts these days, we found there's quite a demand for day classes as well. Well, I don't work, and I really want to get out and meet people. So daytime or evening would suit me. What is it you're particularly interested in? Oh, anything really. Okay. On Tuesdays we have a writing workshop for those people who've always longed to write but are hesitant about putting pen to paper. Hmm. It's an evening class and runs from six to seven thirty, but there is a restriction on numbers. Oh, yes, the tutor has advised us to restrict participants to a maximum of ten per session. So I'll have to check and let you know if there is room for you. Thank you. Also, on Tuesdays there is a book club designed for older adults looking to be inspired to learn and share insights with one another. Are there any restrictions on that? Not really, but you'd have to be able to read the prescribed book each week. Hmm. You have to read set books, do you? Yes, and keep up with the others by finishing one a week. I understand. What else do you have? There's a history group on Tuesdays as well, run by a researcher and historian who provides a fascinating glimpse for you into the lives and society around this area a hundred years ago. Hmm. I don't think so. Well, what about Scrabble Club on Wednesday? It's extremely popular, you know. Sounds good. What time? Two to three thirty in the afternoon. Yes, I think I could manage that. Well, if you like Scrabble, you might like to join the chess night on Thursday evenings. It's more for serious players, though. Unfortunately, I don't play chess. Would you be interested in cake decorating? Well, I do enjoy baking from time to time. Have you thought about decorated cakes, though? You know they make a wonderful focal point of any special celebration. Maybe not. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. Look, I don't know if you'd be interested, but next month there's going to be an adult learners' week, and it's a great opportunity to learn something new and meet a lot of people. All the events are free, but booking is essential. What are the events? I'll give you a brief rundown, and if you decide there's something in it for you, I can send you all the details. Great. When is it? 
The first week in September, from the 1st to the 8th. Oh, are they all daytime events? Yes, but some are half-day and some are whole-day sessions. Can you just quickly tell me about the half-day ones, please? Okay. The Techno Expo will help you work with social networking tools, and you can learn more about online privacy and security and online entertainment. That's Monday the 1st. In the morning? Actually, it's after lunch, from 1 to 4.30. What else is there in the afternoon? Well, on Wednesday, there's work-life balance. Understanding how to assess what you really value, the importance of balance and harmony in your life, and how to achieve it. That's another one I'd like to go to. Are there any more? No, no more half days in the afternoon. Wait a minute. There is a poetry event. What does that entail? Writing some inspirational poems and sharing them with the class. No, thank you. I'm not going to read my poems to other people. I know what you mean. One more thing. Can you tell me where all the events are being held? Yes, all the workshops are at the Central Library. Oh, good. That's handy. That is the end of Section 1. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now, turn to Section 2. Section 2. You will hear a parent educator talking about childhood accidents. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. I'm sure you are all aware that babies, infants, and children are exposed to an enormous number of potentially serious accidents all the time. Accidents where vehicles are involved are always awful, but particularly so when children are injured. Now, of course, most should never happen, but... Unfortunately, the casualty lists increase every year. It still surprises me that so many youngsters fall from shopping carts, for example. With small children, however, the highest proportion of accidents will occur inside the house or in the backyard. Many of the risks are obvious but are often ill-considered, even in well-organized homes. Older children are exposed to a greater number for they are also open to the hazards of the adult world. This should be kept well in mind by parents. Education is vital. There are some very good television shows which do the job quite well, but children should be educated from the moment they learn to crawl, and so I'd say the best teachers are parents, who can instill safety habits in the responsive minds of their children by constant repetition. In this way, they will gradually learn to avoid the danger zones. Of course, if they go to preschool, there will be fewer hazards there, but I'm going to cover a few of the important household areas now. Firstly, kitchen hazards. The family kitchen is actually no place for a child, although children may spend a lot of time there with their mothers. All I can say is never leave saucepans on stoves with their handles jutting out, it's easy for little hands to seize hold of them, and adults can even catch themselves on them, too. Scalding is a serious issue for grown-ups and children alike. If you are transporting dangerous items about the kitchen, always look to see where children are standing. Hot items are naturally high risk. Cooking with an infant at your feet can be very dangerous. Be careful with sharp and heavy objects as well. And not the least of dangers is treading on the child. 
or their hands or feet at any rate. Let's move on to poisoning now. An amazing number of household items are potentially lethal to babies but are often carelessly left around. Bleach, drain cleaner, and similar items should be kept out of reach of infants who have no idea of their risks. And a word of warning here, never reuse juice bottles as containers for lethal fluids and never leave these items within access of infants. Playground equipment deserves a mention too. Even in the most skillfully designed playground, accidents occur. We all enjoy the seesaws, but do make sure that they are evenly balanced. Personally, I don't understand the attraction of the roundabout. It makes me feel sick to my stomach, but the little ones enjoy the ride. Swings are great fun, but children just don't understand the danger of a swing suddenly coming back and striking a standing child. The results are often big bruises or even broken bones. Fractured skulls are the worst playground injuries I've seen, and these are common when young ones fall from a height such as the top of a climbing frame. I think the slides are much safer. Whatever your preference, though, be sure to keep a watchful eye on your children in the playground. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. We are up to bath time now. You know that you should never leave a baby alone in a bath because it's possible for babies to drown in a few centimeters of water. But how many of you have been tempted to go and grab the phone when it rings? My advice to you is to let it ring. And remember when you're filling the bath to put cold water in before the hot to prevent severe scalding in case baby climbs in before it's ready. Moving on to electrical dangers, first of all, power points. These have a fascination for toddlers, and they'll shove things into the holes like hairpins, nails, screwdrivers, you name it. Points should always be fitted with protective plugs to prevent this. Teach children to respect all electrical appliances because they are all potential hazards. Do I need to mention cigarettes? Unfortunately, I still see parents smoking in spaces where their children have to inhale the cigarette smoke. We all know the dangers of secondhand smoke. But even leaving a packet of cigarettes within reach is dangerous because eating just one cigarette may poison a small child. If quitting the habit is too difficult, please ensure all tobacco products are kept out of reach and smoke outside. Lastly, given our cold winters, I need to warn you about heating systems. Open fires and heaters must be covered by protective devices. Even radiators and other sources of heat, which are attractive to children, can cause a nasty burn on sensitive young skin. Remember, there is never a good time to leave infants by themselves in a room where there is an unprotected source of heat. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between two students discussing an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listen carefully 
and answer questions 21 to 26. Hi, Opal. Any ideas about what we should do for our geography project? Hi, Perry. Yes, I'd like to do something on wetlands. I think that's a great idea. Where do we start? With a definition, of course. Something like a marshy area of land where the soil near the surface is saturated or covered with water, forming a special habitat for wildlife. And we could add the flora and fauna of the area are reliant on the waterlogged soil for their survival. Yes, that's a major problem, actually. When commercial developers or farmers come along and decide to drain the swamps, everything dies. The practice is all too common, unfortunately. Did you know that, as a result, wetlands are recognized internationally? as one of the most threatened types of habitat? That's right. We'll have to be sure to discuss their importance in our assignment. But first, I think we should state some of the particular characteristics of wetlands. Well, there are three that I can think of. To start with, wetlands are limited areas of open water, which vary depending on seasonal fluctuations. Yes, and the second could be that there's usually a variety of water-tolerant flora on the banks and throughout the water. Of course, depending on the time of year, there may be more or less water, but levels generally remain quite shallow. Okay, now let's move on to the importance of wetlands. Shall we start with plant and wildlife habitat? Yes, I think we should point out that wetlands are homes for countless species of water birds, frogs, invertebrates, and fish. And they support many varieties of water-loving plants. Which brings us naturally to the topic of biodiversity. Even small wetlands act as borders between land and permanent water. They turn into refuge areas or sanctuaries in times of drought and they often support rare and threatened plants and animals found nowhere else. Exactly. And they're especially important as nurseries and breeding grounds for all kinds of fish, birds, and invertebrates. Wetlands are important for improving the purity of the water, too. Yes. That's because the flow of water through the wetlands is slowed by bank and in-stream plants, and so it allows sediment to settle. Nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus and other pollutants are removed as the water passes through. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Okay, at this point, I think we should look at mangroves. They're important for nutrient removal. I think nutrient recycling is more accurate and biological productivity because wetlands are really very productive ecosystems. Should we do a food web then? We should do a diagram of some sort showing the importance of mangrove trees, but maybe not a food chain. How about you explain it while I try and sketch it? Right. Well, let's start with the mangrove trees. They're very special because of their aerial roots that allow them to breathe even when the tide is high and their roots are underwater. They can live in salt water and the salt enters through the roots, travels up to the older leaves, and then these die and drop back into the water. A unique feature of mangroves is their ability to develop leaves on their seeds while they're still on the tree. And the seedlings drop down, planting themselves directly into the mud underneath. Hmm, got that. What happens to those older leaves that fall? The fallen leaves, or litter, decay in the water and form a rich mud that feeds bacteria, 
worms, and small crustaceans. You mean things like prawns and crabs feed on the decomposed leaves? Yes, and even little fish do as well. And bigger fish feed on them? Eventually, the remaining organic matter, which is now just very tiny particles, is taken up through the root system, providing nourishment for the mangrove trees. And the cycle begins all over again. Yes, that's exactly it. That's what we'll call it. The nutrient cycle of mangrove litter. Great. I'll go home and work on this, and we'll meet again tomorrow. Okay. See you then. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a lecture on meteorology and cloud formation. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning. It's good to see so many of you taking an interest in meteorology. As you are all newcomers to the topic, let's keep it simple to start with. In fact, let's begin with a very simple definition of what meteorology is. The suffix "ology" gives you a clue. At least you can all guess that it is the study of. Something, meteorology is in fact the scientific study of all changes in the atmosphere, essential for forecasting the weather, of course. And you all know what weather is, right? The four main ingredients are the sun, the atmosphere, water vapor, and the wind. They all come together, disseminating heat from the sun around the globe and making clouds in the layer of the atmosphere directly above the ground, which is called the troposphere. Look up into the sky, and on almost any day of the year, you'll see clouds. Clouds form when water that has evaporated from the surface of the Earth condenses onto microscopic dust particles or other particles floating in the air. Cloud formation takes different shapes, and they mostly get their names from Latin roots. Now let's look at the five most basic. We'll start with cumulus, which is a low cloud. With a white, puffy appearance, and most often composed of water droplets, it gets its name from cumulo, meaning heap, for its typical piled-up appearance. Now let's move on to stratus, from strato, meaning layer. These are the gray horizontal ones, often with a flat base, that you see on an overcast day, and they too are mostly made up of water droplets. At this point, I should mention fog. Which you probably don't even think of as clouds, but fog consists of very low stratus ground-hugging clouds. The high-altitude cirrus cloud, on the other hand, is mostly made of ice crystals and appears wispy and thin, almost hair-like. In fact, that's where they get their name from the word cirro, meaning wisp of hair. They are generally fair-weather clouds. Not so the cumulonimbus, the tallest of all clouds. They extend way up into the troposphere, and these are the ones that produce lightning, thunder, heavy rain, strong winds, and tornadoes. Beware the cumulonimbus! You already know what cumulo means, and it won't surprise you to find out that nimbus means rain, and added as a suffix is an indication of clouds' ability to produce precipitation, which could be rain, snow, or hailstones. 
As this course progresses, you'll learn a lot more about cloud types. But before I finish today, I want to go back to something I mentioned before, dust. It is generally accepted that when water vapor ascends in the process of cloud formation, it condenses onto dust particles. So it was assumed large dust particles would produce larger droplets and enhance the formation of rain. However, recent research has shown the opposite to be true. Droplet size increases the farther the clouds are from dust-filled air. More dust reaching rain clouds produces less rainfall. Scientists have shown that as more and more dust enters a rain cloud, the same amount of water becomes spread out. The resulting smaller water droplets scatter instead of combining and growing large enough to make up raindrops. This study shows that higher dust frequency is not inevitably the result of diminished rainfall, but rather its cause. Therefore, loss of topsoil from overgrazing, overcultivation, or bad livestock management in areas neighboring deserts will contribute to the continuing expansion of those arid regions. Your assignment for this week will be to read up on this research and write a report on how dust from damaged land may exacerbate drought conditions and lead to further desertification of arid areas. In other words, how land use has an impact on climate change. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.